starting Facebook tutorial, and I'm going to be showing you how to make more friends and uh, how to fool everyone into thinking you have better luck than you do. Sounds not entirely true, but if we can be friends, can we do it? I think that's a great idea. Our main point in life, liking each other's photos, is good, and we can share our experiences when we need them. So let's jump into this little doll, and we're going to be talking about how I got from, I must say, this shot to this. So it's the same shot I would do, but what I've done is enhanced certain features of this young man's face, and uh, also played with things like contrast and color, and uh, the results, dare I say, are magnificent. <laughs> so how did I get to this place, and uh, what were the thought processes along the way? Now, I'm not going to show you how to use the digital doll um, uh, as a software guide. I'm, you can look that up on YouTube. There's hundreds of tutorials that teach you how to import these drives, how to manage your footage, um, how to conform the footage to a timeline, but basically I want to talk about color and how to do it. So let's jump straight ahead into that. Now to me it's a finished product, the end result was something like this. Now this one looks like a very complicated, now this may seem like a very complex array, but when you break it down it's actually quite simple. Basically all we're doing is we're saying, first step, let's balance the nose. Second step, let's have a look at different aspects of the image that we want to recapture. Uh, third step, let's have a look at the focus of the image and where we want our um, viewer to look. How do we enhance that? And then we have a final contrast node and then just a final minor adjustment node. But I'm going to go through all of this stuff right, right, right now. So let's have a look at the original shot right here. Now it was shot on red. I shot this with my red Scarlet X. Actually, the very first film that I shot was my red Scarlet X. And um, if we have a look at the quick properties here, you can see that we, uh, by default, the way I shot this was, uh, with red color three times, and a gamma curve of red point three. Now what the hell do these things mean? Well, the color space is referring to red interpretation of the color on the sensor. So when you press record, you're going to be recording or decoding the raw data, anything with a specified color range, the grains in red as the letters in the image. Now this is their best and most latest color science, which is red color three. Now remember, these are starting points for our array. The next thing is the gamma curve. Now, it's very important to understand what a gamma curve is, and it's important to understand what and how to be able to adjust that. So in shooting RAW, you have the ability to change the gamma curve. Basically, a gamma curve is designed to make the image look good flat to squat. The gamma curve is the platform of raw data, contrast, saturation, to give the image a much more pleasing look and feel. But to quickly grade this image, I want to be in charge of that gamma curve. I want to be the one who sets that look. So it's ideal to actually shoot and record in a gamma curve that's much, much flatter than that. Because what this is doing is actually already crossing our sensor, giving us quite a flat looking image, which then goes into the OGD filter instead. And I change my gamma curve to red light film. Look how much flatter it looks again. It can actually look terrible, doesn't it? But the beauty is this thing is amorphous as well because we are the masters of this color. We, we want to start from the very beginning and go, I want the camera to do um, virtually anything in what we are sort of looking at, other than give us a most intense effect. So that's why people talk about shooting flat, and um, that's exactly what we've just done here. Thanks to the ability of RAW, we have tuned our gamma curve to red light film. Now, I do suggest using red color three. So here we have a good starting point. But let's, what do we do creatively to kind of make this shot really, really sing? Because it is heavy. It's got to be a fast and tight shot. So the first thing we do is we look at the contrast of the image. Is there a black point in this image? I don't think there is. It looks very washed out to me. There's no pure black in here. Now, you might think under this little collar here, or maybe that black fluff there is pure black. But hold on a second. Let's compare it to this black here. That's pure black. So we actually have no pure black. Now I'm just using these as a guide here, but what if we need to scientifically prove that we have no pure black? So let's right click on our image and go to research red. Now what we're gonna do for the most of this um, tutorial is just using the base in mind. So what I'm gonna do is go to this top left hand scope and click on this button here, that's a base image. And now if I click on this one up, it's just a nice little gamma cut here. So we can enlarge that and make it even more of a gamma cut. That's great. Now, we're talking about creating a flat point, and if you look at the information that lies on this doll, zero representing pure black, and 10.3 representing pure white, we can see that most of our image 
alive and independent. There is no fear of God. There is no fear in love. The fear is stand out from the crowd. So what we're going to do is we're going to ask you to jump out of your way where you live and then pray with us. And you have three great colors to select from. You have the color red. For us up in the three sections, no surprise there. Each section in each county game represents um, basically a a certain lane of town. Red represents your SIA. County six represents your Michigan. And game represents your Iowa. So it's the shadows and the SIA. Now each year you can play with the color of each portion of the game. So the color is the shadows, the color is the Michigan, and the color is Iowa. But we also have this little slide in here that uh, moves those values as needed. Now what we want to do first is grab our list and apply it to the left and to what all of our friends and family are doing. So now you can see right here, we actually have a whole lot of clutter. And my bet here is that this portion of the image will be used real as a guide for our um, visual representation. If we overlay this graph onto this image, it actually represents everything in full in for us. In other words, if we jump across uh, this mark from left to right, and jump across this mark from left to right, you can see that there is a whole lot of rough edge right here. But if we do overlay that on the edge, we see it's a bit more clear. But you understand what I'm saying, right? So now we have grabbed a black image, but the only real black image we've got at this stage is this portion of the image right here, the grass, and maybe a little bit over here on this portion of the image. But before we jump ahead and just agree that that's pure black, there's one thing that I need to mention that are cast in the shadow. Now, when we look at the way through Mind Eye, you can see that there are these different colors, red, green, and blue, but there's also variations in color like purple and pink and gray and white. Now, what does this mean? Well, it means that when these colors of light overlap each other, if they overlap at all in that equal proportion, the light actually turns white, which means this is a pure white or a gray, a neutral light through and through. So when all red and green do the same to match, they turn white. This is really important to understand because when you look at the shadows, you'll notice that there are tinged blue and green, and the red is in that final color. So when we're balancing an image, of course we want to create contrast, but we also want to keep note of the color cast that might be on these shadows. So how do we adjust that? Well, let's jump straight to our color wheel this time, and this is going to link just what happens to those shadowy colors. What we want to really do is we want to link one of the blank shadows to the other, so we want them to be white. So if I run around my list, this is where everything might be kind of balanced. So now these shoulder straps are actually black. They're not just half black because the red's running around them. They're actually black. They're actually pure black. But not all portions of our shadow are blue, so that's fine. So you can see over here that this portion of our shadow is in for red and this is in for that color. So once you understand that, you're off to a good start anyway. The next thing we want to do is a little highlight. Now if you look at these highlights, you can see that there's these green little highlights, but once again, we want to correct for that. So what I'm going to do is slide our highlight again over and over. And once again, we want our highlight to just be the white color. So that's looking better. Now we have even with the pure white, and it's got a little bit of yellow in there, that's fine. We'll just tone that down. And this is actually um, a very important piece of code. This, this is a very important piece of code over here. So what we've done now is we've linked our shadow to the same highlight, but we still need to increase the brightness of our highlight because if we look at 10.3, which represents pure white, we have no pure white in that scene. So let's just quickly have a look at the image and ask yourself, should it have a pure white? Um, portion of the image and indeed it should I mean look at this highlight in the back left corner here that is the sky and it's completely blown out so yes that should be pure white just in terms of the first mirror image and the final image so we've done that we need to do now is just um, color it up and as we've colored it up we've actually increased um, our colors in red so we need to bring that back up a little bit and So now we have a balanced image, roughly. So now that we've created a black and a white scene and added contrast to this scene, I want you to look at the image and think about the size of the scene. Now look at the overall color cast of the image. To me, it looks a little bit pink and a little bit green. So maybe you're going to regret this image. You need to think in octaves. So what is the octave of color of the scene? And if you don't know that, it's pretty easy to figure out. All you do is look at these color wheels and look at 180 degrees 
imagine you draw a line, so if the, if you look 180 degrees across from there, the opposite color is the pink, and this, because we want to cancel out green, all we do is push the red down. And then that's a very sensitive um, adjustment, so, and then let's color correct and draw now some other things so we can very minor lines here. So what I've done there is gone to my gamma mesh and then some black and blue for this guy. So I'll take some of the green and black here. Now what I'll do is I've got a balance in my green here and a black color here, so I'll just give them a line and give them this. So let's compare that to the pink and grey. They're still a layer off. You can see me looking a little bit pale. The background is looking almost black and white. The contrast could be increased. The sharpness could be increased. The eyeballs and the colour of his eyes could be increased. All of these things are going to be in effect. So now we want to create a moving image. How do we do that? As long as you double click on this node and press Alt or F or say anything, or um, Command and Press, then you add node number two here. And now we can start creating a node without affecting the original colour of the node. So keep in mind that these are different. So every time you add a node in, you're adding the, adding the correction to get to the final result, which is what we did. So we'll go into that a little bit in just one second, or even making it two steps. So, but the second node, we want to make an effect. So I want to start modifying um, specific portions of the image. So from our first node, we kind of did that using uh, this three-way color wheel thing where we selected shadows, midtones, and highlights. But now we're going to get even more selective. We're going to use a method called qualify. So if we go over here to the second tool and click on qualify, we have this little magic wand tool that we can use to open Photoshop. And what we could do, for example, if I wanted to select this guy's skin, I could just click on the skin and it would give me an effect. But I want to teach you the ins and outs of this qualifier because um, it really pays down the track when you're making more difficult effects. So let's turn off that magic wand tool for a second and have a look at the image and ask yourself three questions. What color is this guy's skin? How saturated is the skin? And how bright is the dark? So whenever you're trying to select an image, you need to ask yourself those three questions. And let's have a look at the image right now. So at the moment, the qualifier has not been set up to specify any range. So that's in the whole range. So what we want to do is have a look at the skin and ask ourselves, is it green or is it a gray? Well, let's have a look at it. It's a very, very deep shadow, right? So it's almost gray, but it definitely has a pinky yellow color to it. So what we're going to do is go to the width and just crank it in that width just to the color zone between the pink to the skin line. Now, we can play with the width. We can then go to the center and slide that down as well. You'll notice as you slide it around, this color in the middle um, shadow on the edge changes. This gives you an indication of what color is in that shadow. So if we just move it around until we sort of start to look like the color of the skin, which I would say is about there, roughly this size, at least this defining value. The next thing we want to do is say to uh, the qualifier, how saturated is that color? So if we look at the color of the skin, it's mostly very, very desaturated, isn't it? So if we go to the high point, we can move that down one step, and we don't want to select anything in this little shadow here, okay? So if we bring that right down, you can see the saturation's almost black and white for the skin, but it does have some color to it. So that's looking pretty good. The next thing we want to look at is the brightness of the skin. So how bright is it? Is it in these shadow areas? Is it in these highlight areas? And I would suggest that it's sort of around this area here. So if we just grab that low point and drag that up, and grab this high point and drag it up again, let's see how close we've got. So if we turn on the highlight area by pressing this magic wand, we can see, bam, I've done a pretty good job of actually selecting that skin. Now, it still needs to point in, because we actually have to soften any of the edges of these selections. And we did that all um, just by asking those three logical questions. Very, very powerful once we have an image that we've set ourselves to click on the magic wand and click on one of these. So we've got to a pretty good place, but notice we're also selecting these darker areas of the room. So what we can do is go to our low part of the um, room and bring that up. And the higher we go, the less of that darkness that we select. So that's looking pretty good too. So now we have a rough, rough selection, which is looking pretty good. Do you notice the edges of my selection are quite dark? There's no softness at all. So what we can do is start to introduce different colors to our interaction. So I can change the width of my color zone because I know I don't want to select anything green, but you can see here that my selection is actually including some green. So I could move the center of that over to the gray, and now you can see I've got a little bit of some dark there. So we're modifying, we're refining our qualification with the 
because we've made an animated trailer for a new episode of Kids Talk Sport that is going to be out on Friday Night Live, so that's very important. And uh, we can turn off the mask loosely just by going over here and showing none. Um, now we can actually just play with the cool skin. Check it out. And the cool part is it's animated. It's been over there before. So, we have the power to create awesome stuff. Back when it was a little bit silly when you first start, but once you get used to this uh, this little question and playing around with key frames, although I do hate the wrinkles of key frames, uh, once you sort of get a, a grasp on that, this stuff becomes a lot quicker. And, um, yeah, I'm not sure it's going to just turn it off the last few minutes. So I'm sorry this tutorial um, is such a long and detailed one, but I really did want to put a lot into it. And um, since it's my first official, I guess, proper tutorial for the VT, I just did want to cover a lot. So the next thing we're going to do is make another selection. I'm not actually going to modify the skin of this shade. I just know that it's there already to play with. But when I first started using the VT, I just logically thought if I wanted to make a new selection, I would just literally press the X on creating a new node. And then, for example, if I did want to select this guy's eyes, maybe I would just grab a mask and just quickly shrink that down, rotate it a little bit, and then grab my uh, qualifier, use the magic wand, click on this eye, and, you know, adjust accordingly. So we've adjusted the eyes, and that should animate it all the way through, right? But the point I'm trying to make here is that I've made a selection after the other selection. I've linked these two selections, but what, ha what is happening here in the interview is, like I said earlier, each node is an addition of the, of the previous node. So this selection is gathering information based on what happened before it. Now the problem with that is, Sometimes I want to create a selection with inside of that skin, and sometimes maybe my skin selection actually did select the eyes that I was trying to make. So what if I wanted to make multiple selections on this guy's face, but not in succession with each other? Because that's the only way it's going to work now. Well, there is a way to do it. So what I'm going to do is just delete that selection, and instead of making a new node after the skin node, I'm just going to go up to, make sure I double click on the skin, go up to node, and I'm going to go add parallel node. So now I have this sort of crazy looking setup, which might be confusing, but it's actually pretty simple. We've got our original balance node here, and then we're going to have a group of nodes that all reference the original balance node. So instead of creating a selection after this skin selection, I'm creating a selection, go node, node, add parallel node. I'm going to be able to create multiple selections that are all stemming from this original node, and that's a really powerful and useful thing to do. So let's go ahead and get started. I am going to go ahead and select the hair because I want to be able to have the option to play with the color of the hair. So I'm just going to double click on node here, rename it, right click and change color to change the hair. And once again, I'm going to go into my mask and actually before you choose a mask, always just try and make a selection just with the bottom eye. We're not going to go into the three question phase here, I'm just going to go automatic style, choose the magic wand and click on the hair. Keep clicking around until you find something that gets most of the hair and nothing else. Now I want to increase the range of hair that it selects based on normal. So I'm just going to lower the cap on this area so it's just in the range of hair. So maybe to refine the edge of this, I could just increase the blur radius. So now we have a pretty good selection of our hair. It's not perfect yet, but what I might do is just lower it even more because I really want to try and get that whole crest of hair. But you'll notice it's starting to introduce some skin. So how do we get around that? Well, we can refine it by making our color selection. You notice our color selection is in the red at the moment, but with the hair, there's actually no red in it. We've got virtually no red in the selection of the skin. All we need to do is close the width a bit and just keep this as well, actually. So let's keep this as well. Change the width to get a better selection of this guy out. So we've done this without an animated mask, which is really, really cool. And we've changed the radius of our selection too, which is cool. And that's just going to be on there. So we could, just for the hell of it, get rid of these extra components that are being selected by using a mask, but this time it'll be a lot quicker. So I'll just use a window and I'll move around by now. And we'll just sort of chunk it there. And 
once again, you can go to freshman um, Alex. Just turn him off the Zoom for this particular show. And I'm going to leave this person go. And this is Alex Young, freshman who will be graduating this week. And there he is. So once you've cracked that, um, let's go back to the starting point where we started from. And we go to our goal as well. We start with that one. So just for the sake of this tutorial, I'll just make it freshman and Alex Young. Keeping in mind, though, that if your subject is like sports or maths or science, that's usually when you crack it the most. But don't carry this on like that. You usually need to do your own specific thing for that. So, for example, at the end here, the cracker would most likely start up and need a little bit of help. So what you would do is you go to that end frame just before he walks off, and you need to double-click on the layer that you want to click on and then click it. Go down to number four, enable auto transition. Just move the mask slightly. And the keyframe should pop up down here. And then just scrub through the timeline until he walks off the cliff. And just drag your mask manually. So if you scrub through this now, you'll notice the mask is animated as soon as it clicks on. And then if you go to the middle and just find it a little bit. most of the cracker, but in problem scenarios like that, you just need to enable uh, auto keyframe and yeah, you can do that. So now that we have our hair cracked and our skin cracked, we're ready for the look. Let's jump straight on to the next one. And this time I'm going to select the smile layer. So I'm just going to zoom in here. And once again, I'm just going to create the mask straight away. And just keep that going. So we've got one more going to use a polar height to tell that story. So once we've done that, we could just go straight to your cracker and start the cracker up here. So it should do pretty well. Start by contrast. It should be uh, the subject should be fine. Keep in mind that by all things we do, we do just that. And once we've checked on it, we're just going to add a polar height to that now. So I'll just scrub back here until I find the end frame where the guy walked over. And now I'm going to go to the polar height window, click the magic wand, and just click on the smile layer. And just click around until it grabs most of what you're looking for. And then we may need to go in and refine that a little bit. And then we could just go into our mask and tweak it from there a bit. But that cracking bar will remain down for that particular smile that we just did. So let's right click, change layer to polar tile, and then we'll click this layer. And just change that to mask and then none. And now you can see that I can increase the brightness of his eyes, and then he has his best selection there. Put some blue in there. And if I press Control D, I can refine that down to about what we wanted. So obviously, if you can do a better job, I usually do. Yeah. Now, the beauty is that all of these selections and the blur of the eyes are all um, based off the original Blender image. So they all have really sharp colors, the outer parts of the eyes being the skin color. Now this parallel mode here actually isn't very useful for us in this particular example, but it's absolutely necessary for the effect. So basically we have balance mode on the left, uh, parallel mode on the right. And now before we go any further, we need to add some more none. So now we have our group of selections. There's one more selection I need to create, and that is the skirt. Just because I feel like the skirt is a little bit lacking, it looks a little bit gray or blue, and I really want to make it white and subtle. So I'm going to create one more selection. So if we just double click on the subtle, and we go no, then add parallel to skin, and we'll add that to skin there. Right click on that and just call it skirt. And double click on that node, go to our polar height, click on the magic wand, change color, and just click on skirt. Now straight away, you can see I've done a really good job there. I'm just going to increase the highlight range. If you turn the hue off, just see what happens. Now what I'm going to do is actually draw a mask around the skirt. But in some instances, um, it's, this is why it's handy to understand this three-question system, what color, etc., and what drive. Because when you're making a selection, sometimes you actually don't want to include color and drive. So for example, this shirt is mostly linen, and I need to get a tan hue 
and then drag the arrow spoon off the pin, and now you can see how it's selected the edge of that glass display. I'm going to click Move now on selecting all um, variations of saturation and luminance, which is our internal display set. So what are we going to do with that? Well, I'm just going to draw another pin, and that's going to help us with the texture. But I am going to just increase this highlighting all the way to the top. So then I'll just go to our mark, and I'm going to use Bezier tool this time, and just draw a mark. things like this is really what brings um, you know color correction to life it's what what don't you like about this stuff that's the first thing I do I look at it how can I balance am I doing it with the pin doesn't look so good the hair could be different the, the watch feels not crisp enough the eyes aren't bright enough so if you look at things like that think about what you want to change um, it's just awesome to be able to actually go ahead and do that and it's really rewarding when you get the result that you hope for so hopefully this tutorial is going to help you with that so there I've analyzed forward. I'm just going to quickly analyze back as well. And all right, so that's that's pretty good. Let's just go back a little bit. And uh, yep. So now we have the shirt style there on the pin. So we can really work through this. I'm just going to walk it around like this so it's nice and even. So we actually haven't done anything to this uh, balance display, although we are very close to it. What we're going to do now is uh, I'm actually not going to change any of the yet. I'm going to add one more mode and it's going to be called Chroma Key. Now this mode is going to be called Mode, uh, Contrast Mode, and I haven't actually added a contrast curve so to speak. What, what we did in that first mode with the balancing was basically just giving the image some sort of contrast, but not a, not a look in terms of contrast. So now I'm going to use Curve there, Contrast. Now if you don't understand curves or how to use them, I have a lot of tutorials on my blog, maps.visuals.com. Um, check out there, I've explained curves about a million times, but I'm just going to create an edge curve right now, so I'm going to drop the shadows a little bit and the greys and the highlights a little bit. Just so we have some pretty nice looking contrast. I'll just press Control V to turn that highlight to black. And while we're at this contrast, I might just rename it and call it Color Mirror. Yeah, Color Contrast. So it's both. And uh, what I could also do is increase saturation there. Yeah. So now the saturation's increased, the contrast has increased. I'll just do uh, Control V to switch to that mode. And I'll just get rid of this. We actually haven't changed any of these components yet. All I've done is balanced it slightly and added the contrast to the shirt. So it's starting to look a lot better. But let's compare it to the uh, final shot. There's definitely a lot more color in the glass. The eyes are more pronounced. The skin looks better. You know, the few things we've still need to go with. But the beauty is most of the hard work's done and the rest is just fun tweaking. So the color contrast is much better. But now we're going to go back to the pin and we can tweak in a little bit of warmth and light. Any of our highlights and mids can really create the look we want. And with the hair, I'm just going to add a little bit more yellow to the hair, make sure it's just not too long. And with the eyes, I'm just going to increase the luminance of the eyes with the highlight brush and then the gamut brush. And I'm also going to drop some blue in there and give this one an edge. Any of our highlights and mids can really create the look we want. And with the hair, I'm just going to add a little bit more yellow to the hair, make sure it's just not too long. And with the eyes, I'm just going to increase the luminance of the eyes with the highlight brush and then the gamut brush. And I'm also going to drop some blue in there and give this one an edge. Let's go to the camera and drop some blue in there as well. Now notice that the actual whites of the eyes have gone blue. So remember whites being highlights, I always use the gain slider, the highlight slider, to push the arrow up to balance out that blue. So remember the opposite. So now the whites of the eyes are looking a little bit better. Let's do some more blue in there. Jump down to the shirt, and I'm just going to increase. 
Thank you for Brian for giving me the reading. Turn with me to 2 Moses, chapter 1, verse 14. Do you have the church old school? I think it's dated 89, but it's still sort of the original style. And if you see the front of my Bible, at the beginning we had a lot of things colored, but this is our early one. Well, now what if I wanted to affect everything outside of me? The way DaVinci works is that it's really powerful and I never get finished that little thing I wanted to take to add to my mind. And I'm just going to add a mark to it. So here's a mark. Now if I made that dark by dropping the shadow, you can see that the inside of the mark uh, is dark. But what if I wanted to move in that um, direction, but then add a direction outside of that same mark? Well then all I do is right click and go add outside mark. And now you can see there's two little sort of dotted lines there. If I control the pen, please note at 9 I went, uh, 8 is the inside and 9 is the outside. So now we can make 9 brighter or darker. So that's how it works. So the reason I brought that up is that I believe that was from the Lord. I want to go to the pen mode now, and I want to add an outside mode to the pen. So basically everything outside of this pen, I want to add a blue tinge to the shadow. So if I can go right click, add outside mode, you can see that the outside now is a pen. And I'm just going to rename that to Shadows. And basically just jump straight to the color wheel, go to the list or the shadows area, and just click blue. And I'm just going to go deep in the color wheel now. You could also drop the brightness a little. And if you just go control C, you can see the before and after there. Um, finally, what we're going to do um, is add what I call focus mode. So if we go to Alt F, so double click on the last one, go Alt F, that's the end mode. And um, what we're going to do is just draw a simple mark around the shadow. So I'm going to soften the actual tint out of my mark. I'm going to soften it. And this is almost going to be like a dim mark. But basically, on the inside of that mark, I'm just going to increase that gradient of brightness. I'm going to go to my sharpness, and I'm just going to add a little bit of sharpness. Uh, with the sharpness, the way it works, sharpening and softening, anything in the middle at 50, that means that there is no sharpness or softening going on. Anything above 50 is absolute sharpness. You can see there, it's completely in focus, no matter what it is. And anything below 50 is sharpness. Now you can see there's very, very sharpness. Sharpening and sharpness is not there. Uh, generally speaking, with Web3, I don't really like to go above say 40, 50 for quick sharpening, and even that is quite subtle. But you can see what it's done there. I've added sharpness and a bit more saturation just to the center, and if we press Shift A, you can see this is the area I want to affect now. And then on the outside of that node, I'll go right click, add outside node. On the outside of the node, I'm just going to go straight to my scale, and I'll just drop the exposure a little bit. And while we're there, even though we have a super shallow depth of field, I'm just going to go to my blurring sharpening tool and just add a blurriness to that as well. It's really going to force our viewer to look where they normally would. Now don't forget we have to track these marks. So we go to our tracking tab and we just press and hold W. Now the beauty of using the inside and outside mode there is you only have to track the same mark that you see on the outside of the node. Obviously for everything outside this mark is dark. So if this is cracked then you know that your outside mode is dark. So once you've done that and tracked that just as well, you can see that we've got a pretty good looking grey. And obviously the beauty about this uh, method, or the way of using DaVinci Light 2, is that you can just use whatever color you want. So keeping this in mind, this is not the best way to do it, it's not the only way to do it, most people say that I find works really well. And it doesn't work for every shot either. So you really have to get good at um, mastering the color light tool, um, animating marks and things like that. But also just get good at looking at an image and thinking, what is going to look good? What can I enhance in this shot? And even now when I look at it, I feel like my face could be a little bit more light. So we'll see it in fact. I'll go back to this number nine mark. I'll just add my mark, bring it down a little bit, and actually just increase brightness there. Hopefully this was really helpful for you guys. DaVinci Resolve is a little bit daunting when you first jump in, but 
the point of just understanding nodes and towers and that, but also understanding these simple tools and how they can really, you know, give you a lot of flexibility and freedom with color, you're going to really start enjoying it. And it's actually a really empowering process to learn and process, um, especially since, you know, a lot of cameras going raw these days, if you don't understand how to get the most out of the image in post, you're going to fall behind. So not only is it good um, to stay in ahead of the game, but like I said, it's also very rewarding. So check out my blog, um, be friends with me on Facebook, and uh, yeah, there'll be more tutorials to come. Thanks for listening. My name's Matt Scott, and I'll see you next time. And while you're on Facebook adding me, um, <laughs> why not type in Bushy Boy, and uh, in brackets, of course, my name, and check out my work for some of the colors. I'm the writer and director and a good friend of mine who is the man behind the film. So go and check out their page. Um, like it if you like it. I think it's jumping around festivals as we speak. But uh, yeah, it was a lot of fun to shoot. So it'd be great to get your support. Indie filmmakers, unite now. And what the hell, while you're on Facebook, type the ninja for me. And uh, check out the film I'm shooting right now. And we're, I think we're eight days into principal photography. It's a 33 day shoot, feature film about ninjas. Who the hell doesn't like ninjas? If you don't like ninjas, you're probably a samurai, something like that. But anyway, I'm having an absolute blast shooting this film. And um, yeah, back to work tomorrow. I've had three days off. It's been freaking awesome. I've been in like mud trenches with guns and shit and um, explosions. God bless my arm. Anyway, I gotta go. Thanks, guys. Peace out.